Hello and welcome to part 6 of my series explaining the evolutionary biology of anorexia using the adapted to flee famine hypothesis. In the last two videos, we discussed two of the three core symptoms which are restriction and hyperactivity. In this video, you'll be learning about the third core symptom, which is denial of illness and delusional body image. Although not everyone with an eating disorder struggles with body dysmorphia to the extent of considering oneself to be fat, obliviousness to one's true state of health, or should I say lack of health, is a characteristic that is ubiquitous across all anorexia patients. As I mentioned all the way back in part one of this series, I never saw myself as fat. But because anorexia is often portrayed as the stereotypical graphic of an emaciated woman looking in the mirror only to be staring back at an overweight person, I thought I didn't qualify as a true anorexic and denied having anorexia for many years. I knew I was thin, but I never realized my level of thinness was thin enough to be dangerous enough to kill me. It's this very distorted version of reality, however, that can be seen as an adapted survival mechanism in times of scarcity. Be sure to like, subscribe, and keep on watching to learn why. As I described in the previous videos of this series, our ancestors were mostly hunter-gatherers that relied on resources in their direct environment. If resources were to become scarce, starving foragers would need to migrate to a place in which food was abundant. The inability to perceive their levels of emaciation would have been highly beneficial in such a time. Why? Because if they believed they were healthy, they would be more likely to confidently move on and continue migrating rather than being distracted by the worry of their fragile state. Furthermore, people with anorexia often struggle with interoception, the sense through which we monitor the inner state of our bodies and understand whether we're hungry, thirsty, too hot, or too cold. This lack of interoceptive awareness helps explain why anorexic individuals often experience anosognosia, the scientific term for believing you're not quote-unquote sick enough. Difficulty with interoception is also a very common autistic trait, which provides scientific evidence for why so many autistic people develop anorexia. If you are interested in learning more about the scientific link between autism and anorexia, I highly recommend you listen to or watch my episodes, Interoception in Autism and Anorexia, as well as my episode on alexithymia. I will also also link both of these in the description below. Lastly, opioid levels may also be partly responsible for an anorexic person's denial of starvation. Opioids and most recreational drugs heighten one's sense of self-deception, and most fascinating is that higher serum levels of endogenous opioids have been found in anorexia patients. These elevations of neuroendocrine hormones can contribute to feelings of euphoria and unconcern even while being in a near-death state of health. Aside from what we just learned about our ancestors and interoception, it's very important to note that body image distortion and denial of illness were also characteristic of the anorexic saints and other anorexic accounts throughout history, as I elaborated in part 4 of this series. During the Middle Ages, the ideal female body was a curvaceous one. Not to mention, there was no social media that could be promoting an unrealistic thin ideal, let alone what I eat in a day videos. This further implies that the denial of starvation, along with restriction and 
type of activity would have served a very important biological function in times of famine. Comment below what your experience is with body dysmorphia and if this series has helped you understand anorexia better so far. If it has, please subscribe to my channel and I'll see you in the seventh and final part of this series in which I'll be discussing how all of this knowledge can be applied to treatment of anorexia. I'll catch you later. Oh.